All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the City of Livermore's Laundry to Landscape Gray Water Systems webinar. My name is Natalie Croak, and I work for the city in its Water Resources Division. Um, today, I'll be the moderator for the webinar, but our presenter will be our guest, Laura Allen. She has been working in gray water systems for the past 20 years, so we are very lucky to have her talking with us today. So before I turn the floor over to Laura, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. The first one is that this presentation is going to be recorded. So don't feel like you need to write everything down very quickly. I will be sending out the recording after this webinar is finished so you can watch it again as many times as you would like. The second thing we wanted to go over is how you can participate in this webinar. So right now we cannot see you or hear you, but you can still ask Laura questions as the presentation is going. So on your bottom of your screen, you should see a button that says Q&A and another one that says chat. Feel free to use either of those to type in your questions and just hit the submit button. Um, I will be pausing Laura throughout the presentation as questions come up. Um, so feel free to type away using those two features. And then the last thing I wanted to go over is the PDF that has been dropped into the chat box. So this is a design your own laundry to landscape systems worksheet. Um, so if you registered for this webinar a few days ago, you probably already received this from me through email. But if you registered yesterday or today, you might not have received it. So go ahead and click on that link to download the PDF, and then you'll be able to design along as we do this webinar. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Thanks, Natalie. Um, thanks for having me. And thank you everyone for spending this time learning about gray water on your afternoon. I know everybody has so many other commitments and responsibilities and interests. So it's just a great, thing that you are here today learning about gray water, which can be an amazing resource and really help us out during the dry summer and especially during droughts. So I'm gonna get started. And if anybody has trouble hearing me or um, if the connection isn't good, just not, could say it in the chat and Natalie could let me know. I can always shut off my video, but usually my internet's pretty good. So we'll jump right in. Um, oops, let's see, oh, my controls are not. <laughs> So we're going to try that again. Hmm. OK, well, it was working when we did our practice, so I'm not sure what. You might try stopping the share screen and then doing it again. Sometimes it gets frozen. Yeah, it, um, it did get frozen, and it won't let me escape to do that. So I will. Um, can you automatically stop my share? Because maybe it's my computer since you're the host. And while we're figuring this out, I just want to orient you to the system we're going to be talking about. So this is one kind of gray water system. And as you may or may not know, gray water is water from the washing machine and as well as showers and sinks. So it's water that's been used in the home, but it's still clean enough to use for irrigation outside. Um, it, um, we're going to talk about soaps and you know all the things that you can do to make your, oh, there we go, to make your system um, safe for your plants. So my screen share is stopped. Is that true? Yeah, there we are. And you're muted. So I'm gonna try that again. <laughs> so we'll try that again. And of course we did practice this and it all worked fine up until uh, we went live. So we'll, okay, there we go. So we're gonna first do an overview and then about gray water. And then we'll talk about de in detail about the system laundry to landscape. Then I'll take you step-by-step step through the construction and where you would go for materials and installation. Of course, you can't actually learn how to install a whole system just in a, in a webinar, an introductory webinar, but you'll have a really good idea of what it takes. Is this a do-it-yourself project for you or your family, or is this something that you would want to hire a professional to install? So you'll have a great idea about kind of the level of complexity as well as cost and what the system can do and what it can't do. And then we'll end with resources and some info about upcoming events, some online classes that you might be interested in. And so 
there's a lot of other gray water systems. I mentioned that gray water is from shower sinks and washing machines. There are many ways to use it. Um, there are systems from the showers that can be flowing by gravity passively out to your landscape. They're great for trees. They're really um, low kind of impact systems. There's also pump systems where you can send the water up a hill or across a patio. There's also systems that can filter gray water so it can go through a specialized drip irrigation system. Even filtered gray water is not gonna be clean enough for any kind of conventional irrigation system for potable water. So there's all these other ways to use it. We're not gonna talk about those ways today. We're just gonna dive into the one way to use it, the laundry to landscape. And the reason is that this system is really adaptable. It's really flexible. It doesn't even need a permit if you follow basic guidelines, which I'll teach you. And it can be applied in most homes. So it's a great place to start. And it's a really good standalone system that maybe could lead you to using other sources of gray water too in the future. And when you're thinking about gray water, I just want you to take a moment to pause and kind of step back and think about your whole landscape and how you can maybe integrate other types of strategies, other types of water, rainwater, for example, and how you can have these systems work together so you can have beautiful, productive landscapes that bring you joy and beauty and uh, increase the benefit of your, your, your yard that don't use any potable water or very little, like maybe your vegetable garden has potable water, but you can create all of the structural parts of your landscape, all the trees and bushes and shrubs, irrigating them with gray water or rainwater. And of course, this depends on the size of your yard and your home and all these other factors, but just kind of conceptually thinking about how can you incorporate other strategies and where might these systems go so they can work together. Um, and also, so with gray water, gray water is a source of irrigation water. And so it's just, you know, water like anything else. And so there are two questions that I encourage you to think about is how can you maximize your water saving? So you're going to be replacing potable water irrigation with gray water. So how can you maximize that, save the most water possible on your site? And also, how can you increase the ecological productivity of your landscape? So sometimes a gray water system installation can be a great time to make landscape changes. Um, sometimes you just water the existing plants. It really depends. But just thinking about the source of water that you have, what can you do with that to make your yard beneficial to you as well as the environment? And so now we'll start with what not to do. And so this is a great example of how um, an improper design is not going to hurt anything in this situation, but it's not going to save you water. So this is a picture in Southern California where it's very dry, green lawn, mean water with a sprinkler, and this person put in a gray water system. They put in new trees. They learned, oh, fruit trees are great for gray water. So they put in some little fruit trees, they water them with their gray water. So everything technically is, is correct with the system, but they placed them right in the middle of the lawn and they kept watering the lawn. So they weren't gonna let this lawn go, go brown or go yellow. So what they did was now they're double watering an area. They aren't saving any water whatsoever because they haven't replaced the potable water irrigation with gray water. So if you have a situation like this where you have parts of your yard that you irrigate, you want to actually replace, like shut off irrigation, or maybe put an area, if you're putting new plantings, maybe this could have a little fruit tree area that now doesn't have a lawn underneath it. It could be mulched or it just could go brown, whatever works for the situation. But you have to actually shut off some of the old irrigation to save water. So this is what you should not do. And if you do um, an adequately designed system, it doesn't have to be the best system in the whole world, but just adequate, like you are replacing water that you were watering uh, with gray water, you will save water. This is a study we did um, several years ago where we looked at homes that had a gray water system. We looked at their, their water bills before and after, and you can see the chart really shows, excuse me, that graph. The red line is before how much water they used and the black line is after their gray water system. And they saved an average of about 15,000 gallons per year. So that is kind of what you can expect. There was a huge range, of course, because there's so many variables, but that is generally what you should expect to see as your water use goes down, which is why we're doing this. And so I already mentioned what gray water is. What it's not is it's not from toilets or diaper wash water. And it's also currently not from kitchen sinks. Kitchen sinks, depending on what state you live, either go with gray water or don't. And California currently doesn't consider it gray water. So if you want to tap into your other sources, you're going to be tapping into your showers and your baths and your bathroom sinks. 
And so the product, so this is an important consideration. So whatever you put in the drain or in your washing machine is now going out to your plants and you have complete control. So the quality of gray water in a single family home is um, you have control over it, which is great. All you have to do is choose a product that's gonna be what I call plant friendly and your water is gonna be a good source of irrigation for your plants, a good quality supply of irrigation. So you're trying to avoid salts and you're trying to avoid boron or borate. And um, salts are usually like a powdered laundry detergent that's full of salt. So you're not gonna be able to use powder detergents. You would use liquid. And boron, you have to check the ingredient list for that. It's non-toxic to people. So it can be in some uh, ecological products because it is, it's non-toxic to people, but it is a toxin to plants if it builds up in the soil. So you wanna check the ingredients and make sure your laundry products don't have boron or borate. Um, and if you they do, or if there's multiple people using it, you can always turn off your system to not send that outside. And the last thing is chlorine bleach. You don't want to do that. It kills the soil microorganisms. You can use hydrogen peroxide bleach if you need to, if you're using bleach, or you can just shut off your system if you just on occasion use bleach. But on the regular, you know, your, your typical use, you want to make sure you're putting in products that are going to be healthy for your plants. There's a whole bunch of them. Here's a short list up there and there's more. You don't necessarily have to go to a special store. You just need to know what you're looking for. Trader Joe's has a suitable detergent. Um, Costco does, any major grocery store does. But you do wanna make sure you uh, have your eye to the avoiding the salts and the boron. Um, the salts, high levels of salts. The boron, you don't want any of it. So we do have a question. Heidi is wondering, what if you use a whole house water conditioner using salt? Yeah, water softeners are not going to be suitable for gray water. Um, there are some softeners that are um, that don't use salt. So if you're in a position where you can change to a potassium salt or to non-salt um, softener, that's an option. Some people, depending on the, the level of hardness of the water, can just bypass the washer. It can be OK, but of course, it, it really depends on your situation. And then we have one final question. Robin would like to know, how do I know if my laundry products are okay to use? Is there an amount of salt that is okay? Um, if it's a liquid detergent and it does have some small amounts of salt, then that should be fine to use. Um, it, it's a little bit nuanced because some people, the water comes into the home is has a level of salt in it, like people on groundwater or Colorado River water, like Southern California. So the water coming in is salty. So then if you're adding salt, you can kind of exacerbate that problem. The Bay Area typically, and Natalie, you would know this better than I, the quality of the water coming in to in Livermore. Is it a pretty low salt water? So most of our water supply is coming out of the California State Water Project. Um, so it's not as salty as Southern California. Um, so. I don't know if you want to suggest that people kind of stick to the product list that you have here, just so you, it's guaranteed to be low in salts. Yeah, you can do that. If you have a detergent that you're using and you have a question about it, you can always um, send me, send it to me. We have in the, at the end, there's a resource section and we have a forum on Grey Water Action's website. So you can always post that there and I can answer it or someone can answer your question. So if you have a product that you like, that you're wondering about, I can help you determine if that's suitable or not. Um, so we're gonna get into some details about the system. The first one is mulch. And this is something I'm sure you've all seen, it's wood chips. And we actually use this in these simple gray water systems as a filter. So it's a natural um, wood chip in ground filter that catches all the lint and debris in the gray water and allows the water to soak into the soil and it prevents clogging and runoff. And it also builds soil, it adds organic matter. It's this really amazing resource that works really well. And we use it as the filter in, these gray, in this type of gray water system. We create what was called a mulch basin. So near your plant, in this picture, it's a small newly planted tree. You will dig a basin, so it's shallow, um, like six to 12 inches deep, and you'll fill it with the wood chips. It can be a circle or a trench, and I'll show different examples of designs in a bit. But basically, you're removing soil, you're filling it with wood chips, and that's where the gray water goes. So it's filtering through these wood chips, then it hits the soil, and then it soaks down, and the plant roots can access it underneath the basin. Okay, so here's kind of an overview of the system. This is called a laundry to landscape. It was invented by a man named Art Ludwig of Oasis Design, just one kind of system. 
it's from the washing machine. It doesn't alter the plumbing because we're actually collecting the gray water or redirecting the gray water from the appliance, from your machine itself. So your machine has a pump in it. It's pumping out the water through a discharge hose. And so what we're going to do with the system is collect, or excuse me, direct that water to a diverter valve that allows you to control the flow. It can either go back to the sewer. And when you do that, when you're, you have going to your valve and it's going back to the sewer, literally nothing has changed about your home. It's exactly the same. The other side of the valve, this is your, where your gray water system comes in. So now you connect it to a system that you've designed to match how much laundry you do and how much water your plants need. So you've done this design and matching and you direct it outside, it flows out. So you're doing laundry, pump engages, and now it's pumping out the water into your landscape, into basins. So you can see this picture is showing kind of an overview Normally this is all buried, um, the water is below grade, it's not surfacing, it's just going into the wood chip, so there's not a lot to see, but this is kind of showing you what it looks like. It's going to the landscape, it's watering your bushes or your trees, your bigger plants. It's kind of like a drip system, but everything's bigger. That main line of tubing is one inch in diameter and the outlets are half inch. So we are making our system so anything in the water can pass through without clogging and then the filtration happens once we're in the landscape. Um, the cost, it's usually a couple of hundred dollars for parts. Um, if you would hire a professional, it's usually a one or two day project. So it ranges from usually around 700 up to $2,500 depending on um, your situation. This picture is very straightforward. The machine is on an exterior wall. You pop right out and the yard is right there. Your house may have um, a crawl space that you have to go down and through and plumb through a crawl space and then go out and dig and go under a little sidewalk and then go down a hill or, you know, there's all these ways where the system can be more time consuming to install. But this is kind of the general concept. It's a totally manageable for a do-it-yourselfer. If you do home improvement projects, if you put in an irrigation system or you something breaks and you fix it before you call a professional, you really can kind of take the lead on your home projects. You can do the system. It's working with plastic pipe. Um, there's not most every part of it you can easily redo if you, if you don't do it right. But if you're not someone that works on your home or you don't have time, then you can hire a professional. And again, it's about a one, maybe two day installation. So before you start, um, and a lot of what I'm going to tell you, if you're not going to do this yourself, this is kind of informational, and it's great to be as informed as you can, even if you work with a professional, because you'll get, one, you'll know what you want, and you'll know the right thing, and so you can assess if the professional um, is experienced in this kind of system or not, and two, you're just going to have a better understanding, and you'll be able to maintain your system better and understand how it works. So before you start, or before anyone starts, make sure you have cleaned the pump filter of your washing machine. If you have a front loading machine, it has a filter around the pump. Some of you probably have cleaned this out. Some of you may not know this even exists, but if your machine ever is not able to pump out all the water, like it, you get an error message or the clothes are wet when it, they should be, you know, relatively dry after it spins all the water out, if they're like super soggy, probably the pump filter has clogged and the machine can't push out all the water. It's pretty easy to clean. Some of them even have a little, um, little thing that opens and you can get to it like a special little access point. Others you have to take off the front of the machine, but you take it off, you open that uh, pump filter, water is going to pour out, so be ready, and then all the whatever is in there, you can see in this picture some of the debris that clogged up the filter will come out. So to have the gray water system working, you need to have your washing machine working well. So I want to just let you know about this pump filter. So if you ever have any problems with your machine, this is the first thing you should do is check your pump filter. Okay, so now we'll get to the system. So in your home, you have the machine. It has a drain hose that directly connects to that valve. In the picture, that valve has the red handle. One side is going back to the sewer or a septic, and it's a loose fitting connection. So it's just sticking into the drain pipe, just like your washer hose right now is sticking in. Um, you might have a utility sink or you might have you know, variation on this, but wherever your water is going now, it's gonna just return to that place. The other side, that's your gray water side. There's an anti-siphon component I'll talk about in a minute. That's that black thing. And then in this picture, it's going through the crawl space and out to the landscape. You might go through the crawl space. You might go through an exterior wall, but somehow you need to get outside. 
it can be oriented, you know, different ways, depending on are you going to the left or the right or through the floor or through the wall. But the valve always needs to be above what we call the flood rim of the machine. That's the top of your washer. So it's going to be about the height of your washing machine, a little higher where you can access it. And the washer hose is always going to the middle port, which is the, these, the valve, the connections are called ports. You can see in the lower left, that valve is turned sideways. That's totally fine. That worked best for this situa situation. A lot of times they're kind of standard, like just connected right against the wall. Um, this picture on the lower right, this is another kind of common and easy installation where the sewer side, you can use a flexible hose. You can reconnect to the sewer by just connecting a flexible washer hose to your valve and then sticking it into your standpipe. So we have a question. Can the anti-siphon valve be installed outside in case it fails or sticks open? Great question. And we're going to get to that uh, in like one more picture. Um, just to show you, this can look different. You know, some people um, want this to match the aesthetics of their home. So here's a picture that definitely took a little more effort and more cost, but they had the system installed where the valve was inserted into the wall with a custom cabinet made to match the cabinetry of the home. So that is definitely a possibility that it could happen in your home if that's important to have everything kind of matching aesthetically. These can scale up and down depending on what you, um, what you want and what you want to invest in. Stacked washers, they can be a little tricky, but you, you know, they, there's usually when there's a will, there's a way you can find somewhere to put that valve. Um, and we're about to get to the, the um, auto vent. Just to show you, these are plastic fittings, they're threaded, you're connecting up to that valve. You're working with uh, Teflon tape to prevent leaks. Um, this is pretty standard, just, you know, plumbing or irrigation type um, work and parts. You're connecting the washer hose directly to that valve, so you have to get the right fitting and in the resources you'll get you know you'll get lots of details about this so if you're going to personally install this you do want to know all these details to make sure that you get all the right parts and get it all connected um, in a watertight way so the only part of the system where you could do something that could cause you know, damage to your home or you really want to be cautious is when you have to get outside the home. Everything else is working in plastic. If you make a mistake, you can just cut it out and redo it. It's really forgiving, cheap parts, um, you know, not, not a lot to worry about. But getting from inside to outside, that's where you might need to go through your wall. And in this picture, you can see that um, if your wall is like a finished wall with sheetrock on it, and maybe you have a light switch, um, there is, that's not empty space behind that wall. There's insulation, there's electrical lines, there's vents, pipes, maybe even gas lines. So you really want to be sure that you drill in the right spot because you are making a hole a penetration through your house. It's not a big hole, it's inch and a half to send that pipe out, but you do want to be sure you, you feel comfortable and competent to, to um, choose the right spot and drill through. There's lots of tricks that I'm not going to go into to, to help you with that. Um, and if this is something that's like, oh, that's way too complicated for me, but the rest of it feels like you could do it, this is where maybe you hire someone to get that pipe outside for you. If you have a crawl space, usually there's not as much between the floor and the, the um, below, but of course that depends on your home. So just to make sure you're aware of the what's in the wall, make sure there's stuff back there. Sometimes your machines are in a garage, unfinished wall, there's nothing, just studs, empty space. It's super, super straightforward and easy. But other times with finished walls, it's not as straightforward. Okay, so the anti-siphon component. So what this does, it lets air drop into your system. So your system doesn't get a siphon. So a siphon, you know, if you have a closed pipe and you go kind of up to down, water can be pulled through the siphon. And what could happen is it could suck water out of your machine before your machine is pumping the water. So it doesn't happen in every situation, but just to prevent it, we always throw this piece in. It's just a couple of a dollars, so it's not very expensive and it prevents a potential siphon. Um, it's called an auto vent or an AAV or an inline vent. It can be inside your home. It can be outside your home. There's a couple of parts to connect it. If you're putting it outside, it might need freeze protection. So in Livermore, not, not of concern, but if you are thinking about doing this somewhere else, then be aware that if you have hard freezes, this is not suitable to be outside. So it might need to be indoors. And there are variations of this. So you can look into, if you're in freezing climates, you can look into that a little more. It does need to be at the high point of your system. 
So it has to be before you drop down either through the floor or go outside and drop down um, outside the house. And it has to be accessible in case of future leaks. So no water should come out of this. Um, if water's coming out, you either have a defective valve or you didn't install it right. Maybe you forgot to use Teflon tape, but it should not leak, no water. But that in the future though, it could break or wear out. Um, 10 years go by. So you wanna make sure that you would notice if there ever was a leak and you could replace it. So just make sure, don't ever put it like behind the wall where you can't see it. It should be either outside or in a visible location. Um, I have only heard of these leaking coming in defective from the manufacturer. So like the first time someone ran their system, water came out, so it was a defective valve, but I actually haven't heard about these failing though of course at some point they they could and and probably will because there's a little flapper inside so you know you don't need to to be worried about you know water coming out all the time it's like either once it's working you shouldn't really have to worry about it but again you want to see if and when it it ever does leak so you can fix it okay so you're doing some basic plumbing with pvc pipe you're cutting the pipe you're gluing the pipe with PVC glue, making sure everything is watertight in your home. Um, you're strapping that valve really securely to your wall. You might put some blocking. You can make it matching your home, paint the wood, whatever you want to have it look like. But you wanna make sure it's really secure. And then labeling, this is really important because not only do you, well, it is a code requirement, it's also a good idea and it will help protect your plants because you may understand your system, but if you ever have a house sitter or other people, you want it to be really clear, whoever is using your machine, where the water's going. So if they are gonna use something that's not healthy for the plants, like if they're gonna use bleach or you know, who knows what, just something that shouldn't go out to your plants, you want it to be really easy and clear that they can turn off the system. So the picture on the left is just a simple um, note, handwritten, handle here sewer, handle here gray water. You lift that handle up to gray water. That is sufficient. It's really clear. On the right, this is a um, computer made, you know, printed out drawing, printed out sign. That's great too. Some people like to actually take a photo of the valve in both directions. So it'll actually be your valve in your home. So you can take a picture of it with the sewer side, picture of it with the gray water, and then label your pictures and paste them right by the machine. Um, just make sure it's clear. And then if you ever, if you have pipe going through a crawl space, so any above ground pipe, though it might be below your house, any pipe that you can access, it does need to be labeled caution, non-potable gray water, do not drink. So that way, if someone's under your house working on something else and they see a pipe, they know what's in the, what's in the pipe and they wouldn't uh, be mistaken. And so with that info, you can get a general idea of how the inside of your system would look. So this is from that worksheet that you guys all have. Um, the, the bottom picture, kind of three common ways, like going through the crawl space, going out and then down, or going down and then out. Those are kind of three common scenarios. So yours might look like some variation of that. So you can do a little sketch of your system and just be thinking about how you're going to get your laundry gray water from inside to the outside. And we're not going to do you know, pauses in the presentation, but you can on your own time do that, that sketching and thinking. So now we're going to move outside. So outside, there are a couple of calculations that we need to do to be able to design the system. The first thing is how much gray water. The second are what kind of plants are good plants to water with the washing machine gray water. And the third is how many of these plants can you water? So we are gonna be replacing irrigation with our gray water. So we need to know how much irrigation water do we have and then how much water do our plants need so we can do a good matching of water to plants. So first estimate your gray water production. So you need to know how many loads of laundry are done each week. And if you don't do the laundry, talk to the person that does the laundry. If there's multiple people, just put a little sticky note on your washer and say, you know, everybody do a little tally mark every time you do a load of laundry, do that for two weeks, and then you can get a sense of how much laundry is done on a weekly basis. Then you need to know how many gallons per load. Um, if you can, you can actually just take your discharge hose of your washer and put it in a container like a bucket or a garbage can or some waterproof container and run your laundry and actually collect the gray water and then measure it. 
that's really going to give you the best number because a lot of the new machines, they weigh the clothes and then they put water in based on how full it is. So it will be matched to your particular style of doing laundry. If you can't do that, these numbers are going to get you a good kind of ballpark range. An old top loading machine uses about 40 gallons per load. Front loader, about 15. A top efficient, that's those top loaders where if you lift the lid, there's like nothing, it's just empty inside, there's no agitator. Those use about 25 gallons per load. So you have those two numbers and then you do wanna pause and think about future changes. Are you about, maybe you have an old top loader and you're about to buy a new front loading machine. That's gonna make a big difference in your design. Or maybe your kids are about to go move away and go to college and you're not gonna have other people move into your home. Um, or maybe you're about to have a baby. So there are these changes that can affect your laundry patterns. If you have a future change that's coming up soon, I encourage you to design your system based on the, the change that's happening soon. If it's like a someday change or oh, a couple years down the road, then make your system based on your current situation. So the formula is really simple. We just multiply loads per week times gallons per load, and we have gallons per week of gray water. For example, uh, this home does four loads per week. Their machine puts out 25 gallons per load. So they have 100 gallons per week of gray water. So that is the irrigation water that they have to work with on a weekly basis. So you're gonna do this for your home. And so on your worksheet, <clears throat> that's number two, where you do this calculation. Um, the number three calculation, there is something what we call daily maximum. And this is gonna be a little bit of a different number. This is, so I'll give you two scenarios. So let's say you do laundry all on Saturday. Your everything gets in one giant pile or bins or whatever. And then on Saturday, you do all the laundry for the week and you put out hundred gallons per week. Your neighbor, they also do the same number of loads. So they still have hundred gallons per week but they do their laundry like every other day. Um, you're gonna have the same amount of irrigation water but your basins where it soaks up the water are gonna be a different size because if you put out lots of more water on one day, your basins will just need to be bigger to soak up that water than your neighbor who does their loads like one load every other day or so. Their basins can be a little smaller. So you're gonna calculate your daily maximum. <clears throat> maybe it's two loads a week, or excuse me, two loads a day. Maybe it's seven, you know, whatever it is. You wanna think about the biggest laundry day of the week in your home, what is it? and you'll do that calculation. Okay, any, before we go to that, any questions about this calculation? So figuring out how much gray water you have. We have a few open questions on a lot of other topics, but I'll save those till the end since we've kind of moved past that part of the presentation. Okay. Yeah, we'll have time at that. So now we need to know what plants are the best plants to choose for laundry to landscape gray water. So the best option are trees. Fruit trees are nice because you get fruit, but any tree. And the reason is because a tree needs a lot of water because it's a bigger plant. So it uses more water. And one of the limitations, which you're gonna see later is that with a simple gray water system like this, it's very challenging to spread it out to a big area. So we wanna pick our plants that need the most water first because we're probably gonna run out of water before we've irrigated our whole yard. So start with your trees that need irrigation, then go to your shrubs, your bushes, other perennials, large annuals are, can be suitable. And if you're wondering about, can I water a food plant, like a, anything that you eat, that's totally fine as long as the gray water doesn't touch the edible portion. Gray water is non-potable, it could have germs in it, um, so you don't want it to touch the part of the plant you're going to eat. Root vegetables, they're in the ground, the gray water is going in the ground, so don't water those, but a fruit tree or berries or anything where the food's above the ground are totally suitable and safe and legal to water with gray water. So the not good options, a lawn. Um, a lawn is not one plant, it's hundreds to thousands of plants and in California, you have to irrigate subsurface, so below ground. So you can't put gray water into your sprinkler system. It has to be below the ground. So this is just not suitable at all for this kind of gray water system. There are kind of more advanced, much more expensive um, 
complex uh, systems that could do Elon, but you would be looking at a system that costs ten, twenty thousand dollars removing your lawn, putting in a specialized drip system, putting your lawn back. So it's not an easy thing. Um, it's definitely better to look elsewhere. Then we have drought established. So plants like an oak tree. When you're in the middle of a drought, you actually might need to be watering your oak trees because they can be getting stressed. But under normal rainfall patterns, your oak trees don't want summer irrigation. And so you, that would not be a good choice to direct your gray water to. Then we have small plants or potted plants or uh, Plants that are just really hard to grow, root vegetables, not a lot by code. So you want to pick your kind of robust, big plants. So if this was your yard, what would you water? We have the whole perimeter. We have trees, bushes, shrubs. Those are great plants to irrigate with gray water. There's a giant lawn, not suitable. This could be a great time if you haven't already to rethink the lawn. Um, some people are ready to remove all of the lawn. Some people might need a small section of lawn for pets or kids, and the rest of the lawn, you know, the size can shrink and really save a lot of water. So kind of look at your landscape with that eye, what can be irrigated with gray water, what can't, and is there anything that you might want to change to make your yard more water conserving? So now we'll look at some specific yards. This yard is full of potted plants. This is not a good uh, option for gray water. Maybe you could collect rainwater and then hand water these plants, um, but not a laundry to landscape system. A raised bed full of salad greens, not a good choice. Lots of little plants, the edible portion is touching the ground, they're eaten raw, just not, not a suitable plant for this type of system. Um, raised beds with squash, um, this is a maybe. It, there's a lot of factors, so I'm not going to really go into them unless any of you only have raised beds to irrigate. We could um, come back to it at the end, but there can be a way, though of course it depends on the site and depends on how far away it is. Is your washer on the second story or the first story? There's kind of a few factors that could make this a maybe scenario, and you can you know keep you could put the the um, squash like elevate it, put it on a brick or something to make sure it's not going to be touching the gray water. There's lots of things that could make this an okay situation, but it might not work. So I won't go into all the details here. Um, this is just kind of a cool, another option. This wine barrel, um, a laundry to landscape system is going right into the kind of upper middle of that and irrigating and the little plants around it are accessing the water. It's over um, mulched area, over soil. So any drainage is gonna go into the ground. It's not gonna go onto a patio or, or deck or anything. And then we have our great options, our trees. Fruit trees are, are definite, yes. Edibles in the ground, tomatoes could be fine. Foods above the ground, gray waters below the ground. Um, of course, you wanna start with your other, your bigger plants first. Onions, carrots, and beets. These are the definitely not, these are the root vegetables. Okay, so now you know what plants, you know how much gray water you have, you know what plants are suitable. So now the next question is how many of these can you water? If you are a landscaper or if you've done a lot of gardening, you have a sense of how much your plants, how much water your plants need, this will probably feel really easy to digest. If you have absolutely no idea, that is okay. It might feel a little bit like, ooh, this is a lot of information. I'm going to end with a website that will do all of this for you. So um, if you start to feel like, wow, this is really a lot, I'm not sure I can actually do this myself, you're going to end with a, a website that has an app that you just put in a few pieces of information and it gives you the answer. So we'll, we'll get to that soon. So we got to know how much water do our plants require. So really general number. This is just to get you in the ballpark. If you're looking at trees, they need about 20 to 40 gallons per week. If you're looking at shrubs, 10 to 20 gallons per week. If it's a drought tolerant plant, two to six gallons, so a couple of gallons per week. Super rough, but now you're getting into the ballpark. So if you have 100 gallons, now you can tell, well, I'm not gonna water my 10 fruit tree orchard. I, that's gonna take a lot more water than I have, um, but maybe you can water a whole bunch of your shrubs. So now getting to a little bit more accurate number, 
this is called peak irrigation. So peak irrigation is like the summer. So think about July or August, like we are now. This is when the plants need the most water. The day, it's hot, the days are long. So they're, they're uptaking more water than, than other times of the year. Your plants need about a half a gallon per week per square foot of planted area. So that means the size of the planted area, like that raspberry bed, let's say that was like two feet by 10 feet, that'd be a 20 square foot planted area that would need a half a gallon per week per square foot. So that 20, 20 square foot area would need about 10 gallons per week. If it was a low water use plant, then you would cut that number in half again. So with this information, you can kind of walk outside, look at your plants and just get a ballpark range of how much they want. If you're irrigating trees, the tree, the footprint of the tree is like a circle, like the shadow of a tree. So we do need to use a little bit more math. Um, the area of a circle is pi r squared. We are in, we're doing like rough numbers. So we'll just say pi is three times the radius, which is the chunk out to the edge of the branches times the radius again, pi r squared. So you can use that to get a sense of how big your plant is and then how much water it needs. So now we'll go to the app. So if that feels like, wow, I don't wanna do that. Um, I just, I want someone to tell me how much water my plants need. You can thank puddlestompers.com. There's a local landscape designer, Lori Palmquist, who's made all of these great tools for irrigation um, designers and homeowners can really benefit from them as well. So you go to puddlestompers.com and you click on how much water app. And then you come to this, what city in California? I put in Livermore. What time frame? We're gonna say weekly in July. What plant? And when it says what plant, this means is it a low, a plant that uses little water, medium, or high? So it's low, moderate, and high. And most of your plants are going to be in the moderate zone. Those are like your fruit trees, uh, most of the landscaping plants. If you have no idea, you're not sure, you can look at like Sunset Western Gardening. They use a little drop, like a droplet, and it's either full, a drop of water full, half, or down at the bottom, or you can ask your water agency or a landscape company. There's a lot of resources, but generally you're gonna be probably irrigating your moderate water use plant. If you're doing like California natives that are drought tolerant, those are gonna be low. So I was imagining a fruit tree, which is moderate and imagining it planted in the sun. So that's what I chose. And then I have to see how big it is. So this is the width. So branches to branches, you know, edge to edge. And I was imagining a small backyard fruit tree. So I said five feet. And I clicked calculate and it told me this plant needs 12 gallons per week in July. So that's good information. I also wanna know what about not during the peak irrigation? I wanna compare that to another time like October. October can be very dry, very hot. Um, it really depends on the year, but it can be dry and hot just like the summer, but the plants actually need a lot less water because the days are much shorter. So they're not as active. And so in October, the same plant, the same scenario, it only needed five gallons. So when I'm designing my system, I'm going to know that I, 12 is the peak need of this plant. Um, five gallons is you know October. So I'm gonna try to get towards 12, but I don't actually have to water at 12 all year long. I could be near there. Um, also to note, if we're having a heat wave and it's much, much, much hotter than normal, then you have to water extra. So you might be out there with the hose, even if you've perfectly designed your system to meet the needs of your plants in July during a heat wave, that all changes. Like I accidentally killed a few blueberry plants this year because we had two massive heat waves and I didn't water them more. And they really, maybe they're not dead, but they're not happy. <laughs> they really needed extra water. So you do have to be paying attention to your plants, especially with our you know, crazy climate. Okay, so the gray water irrigation design is a really unique way to design irrigation systems because what we're doing is we're matching the gray water with our plants. And we're not going to do more laundry because it's a hot week. Um, we might have to get the hose out, but we're really trying to match. So most of the year, our plants are happy and thriving, and we're not watering them with any other water. It's just gray water. Um, we're wanting to maximize efficiency, so we don't have to water them the peak needs all year long, but we could if we have extra water, but we're going to be in that range. And then we also must shut off existing irrigation. Maybe you can replace a whole zone. Maybe you have zones, you have an irrigation system, you can actually just replace one zone, shut it off, 
And now you can really tell how much water you're going to save because you, you could tell how much that zone was using. Or maybe you shut off sprinkler heads um, because you had a sprinkler system. Or maybe you're just capping off emitters, but you're doing something where you're shutting off your old irrigation or you're not irrigating that area now because your gray water is going to those plants. So we have a question. Can this system be connected to an already established drip irrigation system? No, it can't. This is a completely separate system. Um, I could go more into that. I guess I will just briefly. So one, this is non-potable water. So this whole system, everything I'm describing, and we'll get into a few more details, is legal. There's no permit required, but you must be complying with these health and safety guidelines. And one of them is your system is completely isolated. Once you connect into a drip system or any irrigation system, that system is connected to your home's potable water system and your neighbors and the whole cities. So you could accidentally create what's called a cross connection where you have put dirty water into the same pipe as clean water. And you might think, you know, what would happen? Um, what could happen is some, your, somebody down the street runs over a fire hydrant and it starts blasting water and it causes a big sucking through the whole system. And it would suck dirty water into the clean water system and contaminate all the pipes. So that's kind of the worst case scenario. So to prevent that, there's lots of protections and the water agencies really, you know, this is a major concern because there's lots of people out there doing all sorts of things. We have to protect the potable supply. So irrigation systems need to be protected for cross connection potential. Um, gray water systems, definitely. The simple ones, they have no connection and they're not pressurized. So they kind of, they don't need the same level of cross connection protection unless somebody goes and connects it into a drip system. And then that's a whole other risk. So that's one reason you shouldn't do it. <laughs> the other reason is you're going to clog up your system. Your irrigation system is totally going to clog up and won't work because this gray water is a different quality. Thank you. You explained that much better than I could. Um, and since you touched on it a little bit, we had a couple questions from people who were asking if you need any permits to install a laundry to landscape system or any other gray water system that people might be thinking about. Yeah, that's a great question. These are all great questions. Um, you don't need a permit for this kind of system if you're following these guidelines. So the guidelines are you are in a one or two family dwelling. So it's a single family home or a duplex. The gray water is staying on your property and you're following these basic health and safety guidelines. You don't need a permit. You're legal. Um, basically, any problem you could cause with your gray water would not be complying with the code. And so then you're out of compliance. So an uh, agency could take enforcement action like if you're going to your spraying gray water to your neighbor's yard or it's going on the street or you know any these other potential problems with gray water. But if you're complying with the code, it's very reasonable. It's super easy to follow. Your system can work really well. It's legal. You don't need a permit. Any other system, you are now tapping into your plumbing. So it does trigger a plumbing permit. Um, and there is also the plumbing permit and the gray water permit are kind of connected and that depends on the city. Some cities have made it really simple or I shouldn't say really very as simple as possible to get a permit. Other cities don't have a lot of experience and it might be a little bumpy to get a permit, but it is legal by the state code. Yeah, so I can provide a bit more information on that. So like Laura said, if you're listening to this and you're just interested in installing a laundry to landscape system on a single family home, you can do that without any permits. Um, but our di building division wanted me to let you all know if you're thinking about installing a gray water system that's going to tap into showers or sinks, or if you're interested in installing any type of gray water system on a property that is not a single family home, definitely reach out to our building division early in the design process and they'll be able to help you out um, with some more information about how to do that and how to apply for all the permits. I will send out information about all of that in an email after this webinar. Okay, so moving on. So I'm gonna, now I'm gonna get to some limitations on this kind of system. Um, it's really just a one zone system for the most part. So you wanna do the match, your laundry, your plants. There is a way to make it two zones if you have a lot of water. So maybe you have a top loading machine and you and your high laundry use um, household. You might have several hundred gallons per week and maybe your yard is just you have like two distinct areas so you really are finding wow it's not matching very well i have too much water you can do two zones where you have two of these diverter valves in your home so now you can 
One of them turns your system on and off and the other one turns it to zone one, zone two. That can work. Anything else is just not gonna be this kind of system. Sometimes people try to figure out, well, how can I make this go into like five zones or can I do this? And there's lots of tinkering that could be done with this, but it tends to lead to a system that's not very long lasting or it takes too much user interaction. Um, so just kind of think about this is a one zone system, maybe two in the, in the, if there's really a lot of water. So that is a limitation. This is not like your conventional drip where you can have tons of zones and controllers and all of that. This is different. Another limitation is the system is connected to your washing machine. Your washing machine is not meant to pump up a hill. So if you're, you're looking at your yard and you're saying, wow, I wanna water all these trees up the hill. This is not the system for you. You can still use gray water, but you need a more robust pump to pump the water up the hill. If you look at your landscape and you see a flat yard, totally suitable. The distant, you do have a distant limitation. You can go about 50 feet. So going 50 feet in a flat yard creates the same amount of work on a pump as going a several feet above the washer, which is what washer pumps are typically made to do, manufactured to do. So 50 feet, that's your kind of rule of thumb safe distance. If you're downward sloping, you can go as far as you want because gravity is moving the water. You are going to have to direct your um, piping in a, like an S shape to slow the flow of water as it goes down the hill so you can get the water to come out all of your outlets. So the possibly last limitation is how many outlets? So your machine is doing laundry, it's filling up, it's washing your clothes, it pumps the water out, fills up again, rinses the clothes, pumps the water out. The amount of water getting pumped out is just set based on your machine. Um, you might do a whole bunch of laundry and think you can water 100 plants, but you cannot send a laundry, you cannot send the water to 100 locations. So you are limited to your number of locations you can send the water. You'll just, it just won't work. You won't get water coming out all the outlets if you try to go beyond the capacity of, of your system. So if you have a top loading machine, you can go to about 15 outlets. If you have an efficient top loader, you have to reduce that down. Um, you can always do less. You might only have enough water to water four trees and you're only going to four locations. That's totally fine, but you can't do more than this. Um, if you try, you just probably won't get water coming out of all the outlets and then your system won't work right because some of your plants won't get any water. If you have a front loading machine, usually you can do six, maybe seven, maybe eight outlets. If you have a very, very, very efficient front loader, there's some machines, I think Bosch might be the brand that are like super duper efficient. Those are about four outlets. If you try to do more, you're just not gonna get water coming out to all of them. So let's say you, you see, you, you know, oh, I have a front loading machine. I can only do six outlets, but I actually have enough water to water 10 plants. That could still work because some of your basins can, the plants can share the water, but you can just have six outlets going into a, maybe a shared basin. And let me show you kind of what that looks like. So here's our basins. We're putting them in the landscape near the plants we want to water. We locate them in what we call the drip line of the plant. The drip line is the edge of the branches. That's the best place to water your plants. Um, if it's a tree, you could make a circular basin or it could be a half circle. If you're planting along a straight line, like a row of bushes or hedges, you can do a trench that'd be full of wood chips and you can irrigate maybe a few times in the trench, depending on how many plants and how far of a distance. In the picture, you can see the kind of closest to, to the, lower, the lower image. There's some smaller plants and the basin is shaped like a cross. So you can have a basin that could just be one outlet, but all of those plants going around that basin would access the water. So that's a way where you can actually irrigate more plants just on one outlet. Or you can have an outlet going to every single plant you're watering, kind of depends on your situation. And so I need to do a little note about some code requirements is also to prevent potential problems. So there are limitations on where you can place your outlets. And these are from the plumbing code, which covers gray water. Um, it's called the irrigation field in the code, but it basically it's just where you're watering. So where your basins are and where the water's coming out. You have to be at least two feet away from buildings. So if you have plants along in, in near a building, you would be on the other side, like away from the building side to irrigate them. You need to be a foot and a half from property lines. And this is suitable if your property is like 
you have plants and your there's a fence or no fence and then your neighbor has plants totally far enough away. There are some properties where this distance needs to be expanded. For example, if your property, maybe you're irrigating a front yard situation and you're above the sidewalk, you should be much farther away than a foot and a half because the water could drain down. It, it kind of water moves like a cone through the soil. So if it's coning down, it could come out and surface on the sidewalk. And that's a big no-no and, and not, not allowed by code. So if you're above a sidewalk or above a neighbor's patio, or if you're kind of above anything that has hardscape, you should be five, 10 feet away. So, or maybe even pick a different location if you have options. Uh, another setback is 100 feet away from wells or creeks, and that is because gray water has nutrients in it. Nutrients can pollute water because algae to grow, so you need to be a good distance away from creeks and wells. We don't want non-potable water getting into a, a well if it's a drinking water well. And lastly, you need to be at least three feet above the groundwater table. If you're not sure and you know you're in an area that has maybe a high groundwater table on occasion, you can just dig a three-foot hole and see if, you, if there's any water down there. Um, some places have seasonally high groundwater and you can shut off your system. You, if your groundwater is coming up really high, you don't need to irrigate anyway, most, mostly for these bigger plants. Um, and that's just something you could, if you're wondering about it, if your neighbors have flooding in their basements or you do, that's when you would be wondering about the groundwater table question. Um, Natalie, maybe you, I don't know if there's anywhere in Livermore that has a groundwater consideration. Good question. I'll have to check in about that and uh, I'll include it in my follow up email. Okay. Yeah, I've never heard anywhere. I've never, I haven't heard of it. San Francisco, definitely. Um, East Bay, there's some places. Alameda, there's definitely some places. It's usually in the winter. So, which usually you shut off your system in the winter anyway. Okay, so we'll show some kind of pictures as we're moving out from the home outside. You're maybe you are a second story, you might have to pipe down your house under a porch, maybe around um, to avoid hardscape. Um, in the, a lot of these pictures, you're gonna see the pipe that's white. When it's finished, you're gonna paint the pipe to match the exterior of your house, or you could paint it some nice color to call attention to your gray water system, but you do need to paint your pipe. It's like sunscreen. This um, pipe shouldn't be exposed to the sunlight. It can get brittle over time. So you're gonna paint whatever color you want if you have pipe on the outside of your house. If you have hardscape, you might have to cut it. Um, this picture on the lower right is a, dr uh, a driveway, cement driveway. So they had to cut a groove and then put the pipe and then patch it over. Um, little sidewalks, sometimes you can dig on both sides, like the upper two pictures and get the pipe going underneath it. You just have to figure out how to, to get through it. Um, the picture on the lower right, they decided to tile over it after they cut that cement to make it artistic. If you have to cross steps, you can strap the pipe to the steps securely. The pipe is a one inch, it's called one inch schedule 40 PVC. So it's not too big, but it, it should be you know, really secure so it doesn't create a tripping hazard. Okay, so now we've gotten outside or now we're in the landscape. We have to dig our basins. Um, the basins need to be large enough so the gray water never ponds or runs off. So it should soak into the ground. You should never see a puddle of gray water, basically. It should be going through the wood chips into the ground. This picture is showing you how, even though we're watering at one point in the basin, the water flows around the basin. So the plants are getting a much larger area wetted. So their roots are able to you know, grow to and access water, not just from one little point, it's actually a bigger area. If you have clay soils, which um, a lot of places have clay soils, the basins are going to need to be larger than if you have sandy soils. And if you've dug in your yard, you probably have a pretty good idea. If you get your soil wet and you can like pat it and form little shapes, you have clay soils. If you get it wet and you hold it, it just breaks open. That's sandy soils. So, um, and kind of the, the great thing about this system is if you don't do this right, let's say you dig a really teeny tiny basin, which you shouldn't do, you should always, you know, start bigger, but it, let's say you dig a teeny tiny basin, you run your system, water starts coming up and over and you say, oh wow, I can see gray water. I didn't do it right. My basin's too small. All you have to do is make your basin bigger. If you break your basin too big, no problems. You just did some extra work, um, but that's it's not gonna harm anything to have too big of a basin. So dig your basin in the drip line of the plant. If you encounter roots, if you're working in an established landscape, 
you probably are going to find roots. If they're little roots, it's not a problem to dig into them. It's just like pruning. You can imagine the same diameter as a branch. So you cutting a little branch, not a problem. But if you find a large root and you imagine, would I really cut that size branch off this tree? If the answer is no, then be really cautious of that root. You can go under it. You can dig around it. You could move your basin a little bit. Um, just you know, being cautious of your plants so you don't harm them during the construction. Just a reminder, so we remember back at the beginning, we did our weekly gray water production to decide how many plants we can water. And then I talked about the daily maximum. That is so we can decide how big of basins. So this picture is your home. Let's say you're the, uh, let's say you're the do the laundry every other day kind of home and you've determined this is as a good basin size for me. I forgot to tell you, it's about a square foot per gallon per day. So this basin, I'm just going to throw out a number, let's say it's eight square feet, eight gallons, that plant's getting eight gallons that day, that basin is big enough. But if your neighbor is going to send, I don't know, more, I'm, I'm trying to make an example on the fly. Basically, if you're the doing the laundry every day on Saturdays, your that basin might be bigger than the other neighbor. And I won't give you unnecessary numbers. Okay, so that's that. So we're getting to the end of the system. The water is now out in the basins. We have a plant that has roots. We have water. If we don't do anything to protect the gray water outlet, our plants will actually grow to the water and into our system and clog it all up with roots. So we want to prevent that. We create what we call is a mulch shield. It's just basically making air around the spot where the gray water comes out. And that way roots, they don't grow through the air. They'll grow to the moist, moistened area, but they can't get into the pipe. If you don't do this part and you just put this under the ground, the roots will actually grow right up into your system and they'll clog it up. So this picture is showing one being constructed. You can use little sections of um, wide, like six inch um, tube pipe and cut it up and put a little flagstone above it. You can also use irrigation valve boxes. These are the bottom, that black box, it's circular. It's open, so there's nothing on the bottom. So the gray water flows into that. It falls through the air into the wood chips and then the roots grow to it. Those little green circles are the caps. So they go on it where you can check on the system. So we're trenching, we're installing tubing to the basins. This will all be buried or covered with wood chips. When we want to irrigate a plant, we use these barb teas. So we cut into the tubing and insert a tea and it has a smaller, you can add a small piece of half inch tubing as needed to reach your basin. This will all be buried just to kind of show you what it looks like. So you're adding these. If you change it, um, it's really easy to change. You can take these off, put them on, add more. Um, very forgiving system for new installers. And then I just want to mention um, the end of the line. So this whole system is connected to your washing machine. So you want to make sure that you've designed your system where you don't cause any unintended problems with your, the machine itself. So you don't want to overwork your pump. That's where that 50 feet in a flat yard minimum, excuse me, maximum distance comes from. We also don't want to have our system clog up and have the, nowhere for the water to go. So we always want one place where the system can send out all the water unobstructed through the whole one inch, the large one inch opening. Our main line is one inch, usually washer hoses are one inch. They, they might be three quarters, but they're often either one or three quarter inch. So somewhere that's unrestricted. It could be the end of the line. Um, it could be somewhere in your system where you put a little emergency overflow where the pipe kind of comes up and over. It could be hidden like next to a porch or against a tree or somewhere that's just out of the way. Normally no water would come out of it, but if in let's say three years, you never maintained your system, everything clogged up, the washer tried to send out the gray water, it couldn't get out any of its normal places. And so it went through this emergency overflow. And if you saw water there, you would know, oops, I forgot to maintain my gray water system, but no harm would be done to your machine itself. So that's what that is. Um, and again, you, know, you're, you have a recording, you're going to get resources. You don't have to remember all of these details. I know it's a lot. OK, so there's a way you're going to test your system. You're going to tune it to make sure water flows as you designed. There's ways that you can adjust the system. You can adjust the angle. 
Um, you can put on little ball valves as needed. You might need one or two to encourage the water to flow to the rest of the system. You don't want to add too many because that is a clogging point, so you use them as needed. Um, again, you're always trying to avoid clogging, making sure the water can flow out into the basins. And then we have follow up. So all your tubing gets buried, you run it, you check for leaks, you paint your pipe, um, caulk any holes that you've made to exit your home, you post your signs, you have a maintenance manual. Um, this is for you and for future owners so they know how you design the system and how it works and what to check on and you get your gray water friendly soaps and then when you do laundry you're also watering your landscape and it's really fun. Um, so a few details. If you're exiting your home, make sure you really do a good job sealing up that whole construction grade sealant, not just regular old silicon, which can come right out. So you want your gray water system to not cause any, you wanna make sure that you, you take all the precautions as you're getting your water out, your, out of your home. So we're gonna end um, with a little design practice. Um, should we do questions before we do design practice? We could. I've got about 10 questions here waiting for you. So totally up to you if you want to answer them now or do the Maybe design we'll, practice first. Maybe we'll just finish and then we'll take all the rest of the time for questions. OK, sounds good. So this is kind of really um, kind of simplified version of what you're going to do when you go to design your own system or what your, the, your installer might do. So you need to get the information. So in this example home, they have a washer that puts out 15 gallons per load. They do four loads a week, so they have 60 gallons per week of gray water. So that's first set of information. Then they use the How Much Water app, put in the info, and it spit out these nice numbers to work with. This is how much the plants need. The apple tree needed 24 gallons per week, so did the orange, the roses need six and six, and the bamboo needs 40 gallons per week. The lawn is not even on here because lawns are not suitable for this kind of gray water. So now we start the matching. So we have our machine, we look at the landscape. I always start with the closest plants that are suitable. So we're gonna start putting plants on our system. Apple tree, so 24 gallons per week at the peak irrigation. We got more water, so let's pick up that orange tree. So now we're at 48 gallons per week. We have some more water, so we can pick up those roses. So now we have 48 plus 12, that handily adds up right to our amount. Um, so now we're at 60 gallons per week. That is going to cover those plants during July, during June, during October, the whole year long. So I'm looking at the other things, knowing that I'm at my peak, but I don't actually have to water the peak all year long to make the plants happy. But these other plants, like the avocado, the bamboo, they need a lot more water. So we don't have we don't have enough water to pick up another plant, another one of these trees or the whole um, bamboo hedge. We could stop there, or maybe this home is interested in putting a few like really low water use California natives that could attract pollinators or just be beautiful and don't use very much water at all. So maybe they could plant a couple of new plants near the washing machine and maybe the basin could even share with that apple tree. Or so there's only three plants here, actually four. So we could even have another basin for those plants. So those are kind of things that you're going to think about and talk about as you're looking at your gray water amount and your plants. Do a little sketch of your system. Um, and we'll kind of end with, before we do questions, with the maintenance. So every single thing needs some amount of maintenance. These gray water systems, the simple ones like laundry to landscape, they need very little maintenance, but you do need to check on your system and possibly do something once a year. Inside your home, you have the valve, you have the anti-siphon um, component. You'll see them as you're doing laundry. And if every, anything leaks, you would need to attend to that. So that's kind of a visual just check, just like anything in your home. If your sink starts leaking, you notice and you attend to it. Um, but you don't have to specially check on your gray water system. The thing that you do need to check on is your mulch basins. So those are outside. The, where the water comes out has a little covering on it, so you don't actually see it unless you intentionally go out and look. So when you first put in your system, you should check on it, a, you know, not a lot, but like for, make sure for a couple of weeks you're checking and the water is flowing as designed, or at least several loads of laundry. 
um, you get it working as you want it. And then the next time, and maybe a couple times later, you do laundry, you make sure it's still working. So that's your kind of um, getting the system started. So now your system is working. So now once a year, you do need to go out, check on it specially. Um, you open the lids, you look in there. If you see wood chips and an airspace between the gray water and the wood chips, like you can see in that picture, you don't have to do anything. The water flows out, it's all good. If you open that up and you see soil, that means your wood chips have decomposed and made nice organic matter for you, but it's not a good filter anymore. So if you open it up and you see soil, your wood chips have decomposed and now you with your gloves on and your trowel or maybe your shovel, usually just a trowel, you dig out the soil and you replace it with wood chips. If you have gophers, they might have shoved dirt up into your thing and blocked it all up and you have to dig it out. There are some situations where it takes a little bit more effort, but typically it's just replacing decomposed wood chips with fresh wood chips. Um, and then if you have any valves that you used, you do need to check those for clogs and kind of unclog anything. But it's typically a very small amount of maintenance um, unless something like gophers have gotten into your system. Every couple of years, you might need to actually with a shovel dig out around the valve box and replace a larger area, but it's not every year. Um, okay, so materials. There's um, some local places, the Urban Farmer Store, there's one in Richmond that sells um, most of these parts. Ewing Irrigation has a lot of these parts and online waterwise supply. It's actually a local, uh, uh, I believe it, they're in Richmond now. Um, they have kits where you can purchase a kit and it has all the stuff that you need and you can adjust the quantities based on your home. Urban Farmer Store also sells kits in the store. Some how-to books. These ones I wrote to help people um, design and install the systems. And our website, graywateraction.org, we have a forum where you can go for technical questions, put post anything. Uh, we also have hire an installer page if you want looking for somebody to install a system. And then we have a lot of resources um, in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. And then lastly, we have some online classes. So if you're interested in just learning more or getting kind of coaching and going through the whole design on your own home, you can um, sign up for one of those classes. And there's some coming up um, in a week or so. So if you're, you could check that out. And so very lastly, we got some rebates available. Where Natalie, were you gonna talk about those? Yeah, so I can touch on those real quickly. Um, so we have a couple of rebates that may help you with um, some of the cost of installing a laundry to landscape system. So there's different rebates available depending on if you receive your water service from the city or if you receive it from Cal Water. Um, for all my city customers, if you guys want to replace your clothes washer before getting started with this whole process, you can receive up to $200 towards a brand new high efficiency washer. There's $300 if you're a Cal Water customer. Um, if you decided that you want to redo your yard at the same time you're putting in a gray water system, um, there's up to $2,000 available for our city customers. And Cal Water is planning on launching a similar program any day now. And then finally, for my city customers, if you install a laundry to landscape gray water system, all you have to do is turn in the receipts about 90 days after you're completely done installing and we'll give you $50 back on your water bill. So just some things to keep in mind as you move forward with planning your system. Okay, and we'll uh, stop there for questions. All right, so you have a ton of questions that I'm gonna go through. Um, but one that I saw a couple of people ask is if it's possible to store gray water. So um, rainwater, which is not gray water, rainwater from the sky, you can store that. Simple filtration, keep the leaves out. The water quality is great. Store it for whenever. Gray water is really different. Gray water contains nutrients, um, organic material. If you put it in an enclosed, tank and try to store it, it starts to um, decompose the organic matter. So imagine a bath, it's maybe a little dirty, there's soap, a little dirt in it, but it's not too gross. 
take that bath water and put it in a tank and wait for a while, it gets really gross. It smells bad, it's anaerobic, the color changes. It's not good quality water anymore. So on the logistical side, you don't wanna store gray water, it's yucky. On the legal side, 24 hours is the maximum you can legally store gray water. And then on the practical side, most homes produce gray water every day. So, or every other day, at least. I mean, there's shower gray water, there's laundry gray water. So there's not usually an advantage to trying to store it because there's always gonna be fresh gray water coming of a better quality, easier to manage. So last week's gray water is a problem and it's not legal. And today's gray water is legal, safe, easy, not a problem. That said, there may be some scenario where it, it might make sense. You'd have to really clean the water well. Um, there is another category of gray water in California that's treated by a system that has a certification called NSF 350, and then that water can be stored, but it's gone through a lot of treatment and disinfection. So that's kind of different than what we're talking about. Um, so I'm not gonna say you should never store it, but I cannot think of a scenario that it would be a good idea and it's never going to be legal unless it's a, an SF 350 certified system. All right, um, so someone wants to know if you have ever heard of a case where a manufacturer refused the warranty coverage on a washer, even with a correctly installed gray water system. That is a great question. I have a lot of anecdotal um, information about that more and more of it so it's been when people buy a new washer and they have the person come to install it and they've had a gray water system, um, had installers, this is not my personal experience, people have told me, say like, wow, that's cool. What a great idea, hook it up, no problems. Um, a professional installer I know had a client that that happened to. And so the installer said, well, I'll just warranty that machine myself, like I'll fix it if it breaks. But that's the only time I've heard of a, a company not being happy with it. I've heard them be neutral. Um, I actually, where I lived, I used to live at the Los Angeles Eco Village, and we had commercial gray water systems. So I had to get permission from the company before we put on a, a gray water laundry to landscape type system. So if it was like a coin operated one of those. So I did get permission to do it, and they were fine with it. They just wanted to know what it was. So I don't know <laughs> your particular scenario, I'm not sure, but it generally has not been a problem. That's good to hear. Um, so Ramon would like to know if he washes his clothes on the hot water cycle, will the temperature of the water affect the plants? Yeah, and so um, when the water comes out hot, it goes into your machine and then it's washing your clothes for a while, 20, 30 minutes, I don't know, however long it takes. And then it gets pumped out through the pipe and then it lands into the landscape, goes through the wood chips, and then it gets the soil. By the time it's gone through that, it might still be warm. It'll probably be warm, but it's not gonna be hot anymore. So it should not be any problem at all for your plants. All right, so our next question is from Carol. She wants to know if you have to use purple pipe for transporting the water. Um, with this system, you don't. Um, purple pipe is required for a pressurized um, system, which could be a different kind, but not this system. You could if you wanted, but it's not required. So do you think watering a 60-year-old redwood is suitable with gray water? Um, so for established trees, you want to ask yourself, what is the tree used to? If the tree is used to receiving water, like maybe it's near a lawn that you've been irrigating and now you're gonna stop watering the lawn, the tree is gonna go through a big shock because it's used to getting frequent irrigation and now it's not. So in that context, yes, you would definitely be a great place to put your gray water. If you have a tree that is 60 years old, it's healthy, happy, it's not getting a drop of water from anyone, not your neighbors, not you, no kind of auxiliary water, then that would not be a good, tree to direct gray water to. Generally redwoods, I know a lot of people who irrigate redwoods with gray water. So as a species, it, it's fine, but you want it with a 60 year old tree, you wanna look at what's the tree accustomed to and you don't wanna make big changes to the tree's irrigation, um, what it's receiving. All right, so Carol was looking for some clarification about the end of the line outlet that you were talking about. Um, so she wanted to know, is it left open for all runs? 
does this not impact the water that goes out the other outlets? Yeah, there's kind of two styles. One is it's uh, emergency overflow. So normally no water comes out it. So it kind of goes up into the air, a couple feet, depends on your site. And it's kind of curves around so stuff doesn't fall into it. Um, and it's just somewhere unused for unless it's needed. And then it doesn't affect your system because it's high enough. The other scenario is it is part of your system. It's usually the end of the line and it's going into a basin and water does come out of it. You've kind of incorporated it into your design, but it's just in a bigger enclosure. It's a bigger pipe. So all the water could come out if needed. All right. So next, Bruce was looking for some clarification on do you include the first rinse um, or divert that to the sewer when you're using the laundry to landscape system? So I use all of the water and that most people do. Um, if, you, if you choose a product that is not high in salts and doesn't have boron, then the quality is well suited for irrigation. And I say that um, we based on sending a lot of gray water samples to an irrigation laboratory to test it for irrigation suitability. So meaning, um, you know, plants need a different quality of water than, than we do, but is it suitable for irrigation, for long-term irrigation? And it can be, many types of detergent can be suitable for long-term irrigation of any type of plant. And anyone, actually, I believe it's all on our website. If anyone wants to know more about um, quality of gray water and what's in it, um, all the results from that study are posted on our website. Um, so you could go there and, and read more. But generally, the first rinse is fine as long as you're using a, a product that's suitable. And it's much easier to choose a good a product that's suitable than to have to stand there and wait for your machine to go and turn the valve because it would be a manual switching. Um, this kind of system couldn't automatically shunt the water back and forth. It's a manual switching. Speaking of detergents, we have a couple of people who put the individual type of laundry detergent that they've been using into the chat. Um, so I'm sure you don't have every single <laughs> type of detergent um, off the top of your head, whether you know if it's gray water worthy or not. Um, can I direct people to your website for more information about which detergents to choose if they install these systems? Yeah, definitely. Um, and if you want to read them, I I might not know, but I might if it's quick. Okay, we'll try you. First one is clean people laundry detergent strips. I don't oh the laundry strips. Um, I believe those are um, because they're not a powdered. Um, so if it's those little strips that are like soaked in a liquid detergent, those should be fine. Just check for boron. Okay. Um, next up is vinegar. Okay for a gray water system. Yep. Perfect. Um, tide free and gentle. I'm not sure. Okay. And last one is shout. I'm not sure. I mean, you got more than I expected. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. All right. Let's see. So we're getting down to our final questions. Um, so we have one person who is looking for clarification on if it is okay to have a drip irrigation system and sprinklers and a gray water system independent of each other at the same time to water other plants. Yes, definitely. As long as they're separate, the water is not commingling in the same pipe. Yeah. And if you have an existing irrigation system, don't, don't remove it. You know, it's good to have backup. Um, you can just turn it off, shut a zone off, put a ball valve in, you know, shut off whatever section is now being irrigated by gray water, but it can just stay there. All right, so this is my last question. So if all of you have any more questions, please put them in the chat quickly. Um, but the last question that I have here is from Kristen and she wanted um, to know, did you say that it was 50 feet was the maximum that gray water could go outside from a house? Um, in a flat, so if, you're, if your yard is flat or your crawl space is flat, like you're actually wanting the machine to push the water through the pipe, there's no downward slope on the pipe. That 50 feet is your safe minimum uh, because the, there's friction involved to move water through this tubing. And we don't, if you add up, you know, the amount of friction it is, 
it equates how high the machine can pump, basically. Um, if you're irrigating plants, like in this picture, let's say it was 50 feet to that flowering plant with the little pink flowers, and you want to, and you're, there was a tree that was 60 feet away, you've let out a lot of pressure along the line. So as long as you're letting out a lot of pressure, it's probably fine to go a little farther to have another plant. Um, but what you don't want to do is make the machine push the water 60, 70, 80 feet by itself across the flat yard and then start watering. That could be too much work on your machine. And it would tell you by not finishing a cycle or not pumping out all the water, you would get feedback. Your machine would not work properly. But to save yourself the headache of doing all that work and then having it not work, that's where you keep those the safe minimum. So look for your nearby plants within 50 feet. If you've irrigated several plants and you have one more that you can reach, um, that should be fine to do. People do completely break this rule and some people have no problems at all. Um, others, their machine is not happy and it won't push the water through. All right, so we have one more before I close the questions. Um, so Anna was asking, do you have the name of professionals who can install this system? Now, I know you mentioned that you have your list of um, installers on the Greywater Action website that people can look up. Um, but is there is there another way that you would recommend people find a way to find people who are qualified to install these types of systems? Um, so on that, that directory, you can, put in the San Francisco Bay Area. So you'll get people that are kind of the broader Bay Area from San Jose to um, Solano County. So not everyone would come to you probably, but there's not, there's not so many that it would be too overwhelming. So I would start there. There People are really busy right now because of the drought. So it, it might be hard if, because everyone who's known to install gray water is now getting a lot of requests right now. So you might have to wait, um, but I would start there. And if you can't find someone, the book I wrote, Greywater Green Landscape, really takes you step by step through the design and the installation. So if you have a trusted landscaper who will follow directions, um, there's a lot of people that think, oh, I can do it different, you know, and they may never have done it or done it once. And they, I, I would not recommend letting someone experiment on your house. I would go for the tried and true system. So if you can find someone that will follow directions and won't tell you, oh no, I'll just, I'll do it better, do it different. Um, then you could give them the book. Um, we've had, you know, people send their landscaper to some of our trainings. We have the online training. You could try to train somebody that's interested that that's another way to get more skilled people. Um, or if you had a great design yourself and you just hire someone to implement it, um, that could work too. But I would start with like ecological landscapers. This is landscaping. Plumbers are, plumbers can do all the home plumbing work, but plumbers are not the right tradesperson to install this kind of system. Cause this is, as you can see, it's mostly plants, it's irrigation design. It's just a whole skill set that plumbers, it's not part of their training. Thank you. That's really helpful. I definitely have learned a lot during this webinar, and I just wanted to thank you so much for leading this today. Um, so before we sign off, I just wanted to let everyone know that this webinar was recorded. So I will email out the video to everyone so you can watch it again if you need to. Um, I'll also be sending out a few resources to help you all with your design process. Um, so I'll be sending out the names of the two books that Laura mentioned. Um, links to Greywater Action, which is a group that she co-founded that has lots of amazing resources for you all. And I'll also be providing you with um, some information from the city in terms of what you need to know for permitting and also um, some diagrams showing kind of a, a sample laundry to landscape system and the different parts that you'll need to buy in order to install it. Um, but that's it from me. Was there anything else that you wanted to say before we wrap it up, Laura? Um, no, but just thanks again, everybody, for your interest. And I hope that you can find a way to use gray water. Maybe it's not the system, maybe it's another system, or maybe you can share this with a neighbor or a family member if they might be able to use it. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.